Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to You in the name of Jesus Christ. I humble myself before You. Lord, without Your anointing, I'm nothing. I ask for Your anointing of the Holy Spirit. I submit to You. And I pray that we have ears to hear Your Word. And bless each of us. And Lord, let a church come forth that's all You ever intended for the church to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Are you hungry and thirsty for God? Are you really pursuing God? I've done a lot of study the last couple of weeks. Now, I didn't know by the, except things that the Lord had told me about godly restoration or deadly storms, but I had not heard in my spirit the name COVID uh, in 2019. But toward the end of 2019, the Lord told me to really step it up in 2020. And you'll understand this more as we go on. Some of you heard some of these things before that the Lord has spoken to me. But we will have godly restoration or there will be devilish storms. And as we moved into this year, the Lord said, uh, He repeated something He had said to me in the past. He said, you haven't seen anything yet. Now the anything yet that He wants is a glorious church to come forth. The anything yet that it does not want are storms of the devil beyond your comprehension. And I want to tell you, right up front, we haven't seen anything yet. We're going to see one or the other. Now, I may be with the Lord, you may be with the Lord before some of it takes place. But before Jesus Christ returns to this earth, and the Baptists and the Pentecostals would not understand this. There will be a glorious church on this earth that completes what Jesus wanted His church to complete before He returns. Then, when that is completed, He will catch us up and not before. I don't care how famous they are. I don't care how many books they've written how many radio, television programs they have, they are wrong if they think Jesus is going to take the church out of this world before the church finishes her course. I thank God for every saint there's ever been since Jesus was crucified. Thank God for the Old Testament saints. Thank God for what they accomplished. But we have not completed what the Lord wants the church to complete as of yet. To take us out now, and I've been places, uh, I remember many years ago, probably back in the 70s or 80s, we were visiting Susan's parents up in the mountains of North Georgia. And so I got up on Sunday morning and went out and found a church. And they had Jesus coming that night, as it were. And uh, He didn't. And, and they don't understand that He's coming for a glorious church. Everyone in the past has done their part, but it hasn't been finished. For Him to take us out before we finish our course would be like the Father taking the Son off the earth before He finished His. And where would we, we be without that? No one could be saved if Jesus had not completed His course. you understand that? Alright, so when He said, I'll build My church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, He meant it. Well, how are we doing right now? How are we doing against the gates of Hades? Also, we all know, how many of you know our Father who art in heaven? If you're in church, you learned it as a child, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I've got more understanding of that than I did last week. We must have His kingdom to come and His will be done. In us. Now there's a great confusion about the kingdom of God. 
it will not be fully manifested until Jesus does return. But He's to rule and reign in us now. And if He's ruling and reigning in us now, then His will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what He wants. Some years ago, and some of you have not met Mark and Joni, some have, Mark and I, this is many years ago. I believe it's when we first, I first met Philip, I believe. We went out to eat. I believe it was Philip. And uh, uh, we went to, to the Golden Corral. And I believe there were four of us. And, and uh, they looked across the table at me and they said, uh, besides the Bible was the intention of it, uh, who are the, read the writers that you read from? And I quickly said, most of the ones I read from are dead. And one of those is A.W. Tozer. And just want to read something real quickly. It's called The Pursuit of God. This week I was studying the Bible and, um, and another book about the wilderness experience. And uh, the wilderness in the book, the writer also talked about the pursuing God. But the Lord kept saying to me, pursuit of God, pursuit of God, pursuit of God. And I, I knew I had the book in my, uh, where, uh, where my books are. But I kept doing other things. And one night, I believe I'd already been to sleep. And the Lord uh, I woke, woke me up. And I, as tired as I was, as sleepy as I was, I got up and went to the bookshelf and pulled that book out. And um, uh, the first one I pulled out, uh, I believe it was marked up so many times in, in different kinds of ink that after I read about 17 pages, I knew I had another copy. And I went back and got it, and it happened to be one that belonged to Glenn Donahue, our good friend who passed away a few months ago. And so I reread the book this week. But I, I just want to read something to you. And now, Brother Tozer was not an uh, outstanding dynamic speaker. But he was an amazing writer. Now when he spoke, he did speak truth. Now making that point, because a lot of people today don't listen unless the, spirit, the, the speaker is dynamic. Get some stirred in their emotions. Moves around on the pulpit. Uh, I'll hold it there, but there's some I don't like to look at on television. <laughs> Nothing wrong with moving around on the pulpit. Uh, I'd be moving around if, uh, if I could this morning because I'm stirred inside. But uh, Brother Tozer loved the Lord. Uh, I'll be reading another book by him this week. Is God Pursuing Man? God's Pursuit of Man. So he loved the Lord and he loved God's people, but he had discernment and uh, this book was completed in 1948. And at that time, by the Spirit, he already saw the condition of the church. And he talked about how, uh, using some Old Testament terminology, that uh, ministers and evangelicalism, they're moving things around, the stones and arranging the pieces on the altar, but there's no fire. No fire. Then he moves on to, that, to say there are a lot of Bible teachers today correctly uh, bringing the principles of the Word and doctrines of Christ, teaching certain fundamentals, but there's no manifest presence. There are a lot of saved people who do not experience the manifest presence of God. The Word of God says draw near to God and He'll draw near to you or to us. Well, that does not mean that uh, once we start drawing near to God, uh, all of a sudden He's going to start drawing near to us. He's already pursuing us. It's just when we decide to pursue Him, then we come together. And God wants all of us, all of His people to experience the manifest presence of God. So I encourage you to get this book. Uh, the one Brother Tony mentioned in the back, he's right. Even the writer of the book uh, says you've got to read it at least twice to even start understanding it. So how determined are you to pursue God in the school of Christ? Brother Tozer goes on to mention Milton, a poet. 
He said, Milton's terrible sentence applies to our day, remember this is 1948 or earlier, as accurately as it did to his. The hungry sheep look up and are not fed. The hungry sheep look up and they're not fed. It's a solemn thing. And no small scandal in the kingdom to see God's children starving while actually seated at the Father's table. Then he goes on to mention something that Brother Wesley said. He said, The truth of Wesley's words is established before our eyes. Orthodoxy, a right opinion, is at, le at best a very slender part of religion. Though right tempers care, cannot subsist without right opinions, yet right opinions may subsist without right tempers. There may be a right opinion of God without either love or one right temper toward Him. Satan is a proof of this. I had to read this several times to understand those sentences by Brother Wesley. And then he talks about our splendid Bible societies and other effective agencies. But he says, Yet I wonder if there was ever a time when true spiritual worship was at a lower ebb. That was 1948. Open your Bibles, please, to Jude, just before Revelation. I was listening to one minister, uh, uh, maybe been Brother Wilkerson, he said, go to here and turn right. <laughs> Verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It's not just contend for the faith, it's contend earnestly for the faith. The Spirit of the Lord is looking throughout this earth for people who will contend earnestly for the faith. The true faith. And I know there's a lot of things going on in the Word of Faith movement and others, and they've got some truth, but real faith comes when we really look at Jesus and, and focus upon Him and let Him live His life in and through us. Then we're living by faith. Then the promises of God become a reality. Some people are looking at the promises more than they are the promiser. We've got to get our eyes fixed on Him. So the Lord is looking for people that will earnestly contend for the faith. Now please turn to Psalms 127. Verse 1. And then I'll give you some meaning to this. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. This particular Bible has what's called truth in action. And on certain verses, it'll give a note about it. On verses 1 and 2, of chapter 127, it says, Know that employing your skills for the Lord is futile without His presence and anointing upon them. Remember I said manifest presence. We've got to have the manifest presence of God. That means not in doctrine only. We've got to have the manifest presence. Just like we contend earnestly, it's manifest presence. The presence is manifested. 
And we've got to have the anointing. Luke 4.18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then He names the things that He did. And then before He left this earth, He said, You will do the same. But make sure you're born again and make sure you've got the power. And we're born again by the Spirit, but the power comes when we're baptized by the Spirit. I've not been watching any presidential debates, but I've been watching some spiritual debates. Some of them are almost three hours long each. And one was between a man, uh, his name is Dr. Brown. And uh, he was, uh, I believe, born a Jewish, man, a Jewish person. I believe he had some trouble with drugs and other things, but he became a man of God. And he studies the Word of God. And he was debating about the gifts of the Spirit. And so I watched him. Both of them very intellectual, but one uh, more spiritual than the other from my perspective. And at the end uh, of the debate, and there was, there was another debate with two other men debating. And again, you had a spiritual man and you had one that was just doing some intellectual things. Uh, so I, I encourage if you're interested in watching these things, you can go to YouTube and just put in Dr. Brown and you'll see some of this, but put in uh, things about the gifts of the Spirit and you'll see some things there also. But this, uh, after all of this debate, and, and one man almost got hostile, but at the end, he turned toward the person he was debating and said, uh, well, if you can show me a miracle, then I'll believe. What would you have thought of immediately if you're a student of the Word? Tell you what I thought of immediately is what they said to Jesus on the cross. Come down and then I'll believe. Guess what? The man of God debating thought of. Same thing. And I pray that when he spoke truth to that man, conviction came all over. We need people today that will speak truth and let conviction come. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. The anointing. I watched a program on uh, Friday. I won't name the program. And I saw two things that concerned me. Now, I have to preface this by saying I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, and I'm definitely not a Libertarian. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God that seeks God in His kingdom and lives by His Word, but I do vote. And I vote the Bible, but when somebody, I, I saw uh, one particular ministry saying, vote the Bible, vote the Bible. You've got to say, vote the Bible rightly divided. Because... This week I was looking at something on Facebook. And if you want to see some things that I write, go to Facebook. I went there because a man of God said, Wayne, the things you are saying need to be on Facebook. So I started going there to proclaim the things that the Lord gives me. And I'll share a couple, few of those things in a moment. But I started reading and, and this person was, was, was using Scripture, but all of a sudden I thought, it's not being used properly. And it was mainly emphasizing just open the borders and let people come in. It's talking about things in the Bible, you know, caring for the aliens and, and things like that with, with uh, a progressive interpretation. Well, then uh, before I finished reading, I looked down and saw who posted it. And it was a guy I started first grade with. And he's a socialist, a retired Methodist minister. Very proud. Uh, I say that because I, years ago, the Lord put on my heart to contact people from my past. And I started contacting them all across the country. From in California and all other places. But I had a hard time getting in touch with this guy. I knew he had graduated from Emory and had been a Methodist minister. By the way, I was an evangelism chairman in a Methodist church, the one here in town many years ago. Uh, but <clears throat> I finally left a message with a minister, I believe, in North Carolina that knew him. 
And so the man calls me. And we have a good conversation. But when I got through, I hung up the phone. We hung up the phone and I just said to myself, he's proud and he's a socialist. And he is. And rather than praying for the president, he's always condemning him. And uh, taking every opportunity he can to, to write things against him. We're supposed to pray for our spiritual leaders. Our political leaders also. I am going to vote, and I'm going to vote the Bible rightly divided. I am not going to vote, and I'm going to vote with discernment. And I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you, I'm going to vote with discernment. I'm going to vote with the Bible rightly divided. And I'm not going to vote for those who want to bring globalism to the United States and take over. I'm not going to vote for those that want to make us a socialist, Marxist, communist country. By the way, if you study the history, the communists were already putting pastors in churches in the United States in the 1930s. We're just reaping the results of seeds that have been sown for a long time right now. And part of things that are coming, we still, besides all the things going on within our country, we still got Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, North Korea, and some other places to contend with. And they are liking all the dissension and the division that's going on in this country right now. So before, when I've ministered, I've told you, you're a, you are a kingdom of priests. You're part of a kingdom of priests. Kings have authority of the name of Jesus, and priests make intercession. So we rule on earth through prayer, fasting, and intercession. <clears throat> I said I've studied a lot recently and I had a lot of things that I wanted to share with you. And so in the next few minutes, before we close, I'm not going to keep you all night like Paul did. <laughs> but at the first of this month, I, I wrote some things. And I said, the, speak, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to me about how lies, deception, and confusion are leading many professing Christians to support and vote for evil rather than for good. A woman I knew many years ago who worked in a particular church where I worked, I read where she wrote, I'm pro-life, but I'm voting for the other person. Uh, that's just plain deception. That's a confused mind. You know that Satan is the father of lies and you can say he's the father of deception. He's also the author of confusion. If you are a steward of the Word, and you should be if you are hungry for God, have you forsaken all to follow Jesus? We've got to cut our ties with the world. We're in the world, but not of it. And a lot of Christians can quote that and then they go out and they're just tied up with the things of the world. Then you know, you know about last day's deception if you are a student of the Word. And I was up late last night, up early this morning, going through Scripture. And in the epistles, it will amaze you if you look closely how many times it warns about false teachers. And then when you go to the Old Testament, False prophets, false prophets, uh, and false teachers today. They're all around us. They're in the churches right here in Conyers, Georgia. <clears throat> you got a pastor writing in the paper talking about love, but that pastor doesn't know the love of God, doesn't know Jesus. I promise you that pastor's not born again. And definitely... There's a lot of pastors that have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's kingdom versus kingdom. Now the church is not the kingdom of God. But who's supposed to seek first the kingdom of God? It's the church. And we're supposed to be one. Now I mentioned the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. But how many of you know the prayer in John 17? 
And almost every time I minister to you, I, I talk about John 17. That's another prayer. It's the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Now He's the high priest, but you're supposed to be a priest. He's the king with a capital K, but you're supposed to be a king. Are you living like a king and a priest? I'm not talking about people going out and wanting to get rich because they're king's kid. I'm talking about taking the authority of the name of Jesus and getting on your face and crying out to God. And, and in these things I wrote this week, uh, or this month, there's one place where I said people's prayer life, a lot like somebody cranks their car and backs it out of the garage, but never goes anywhere. They never complete the trip. So people get up in the mornings, they have a little prayer, read a little devotional book. That's it. That's not praying without, ce uh, pray without ceasing. And praying without ceasing doesn't mean you're actually verbally talking to God all day long or you couldn't talk to, you, to your friends. But you stay in that spirit of prayer. And the Holy Spirit moves, you pray. I've been thinking a lot about something, and Mark, I've gotten a little bold about this recently. Uh, I have a pastor's heart, but God called me to be a prophet. Now that will just tear the Baptist up. Even my relatives. Because most of my relatives are Baptists. Oh, there are no prophets. There are no apostles today. Well, there are evangelists. And there's a minister I watch on television on a, at times, and he'll say, I'm an evangelist, and he'll name his name. This morning I watched a preacher that I had never seen before, and he said, I'm a pastor. And then he explained what pastors do. Well, I'm a prophet. Now let me tell you what a prophet does. Prophet not only tells you things about the future, prophet tells you what God's emphasizing. Go back and study things in the Old Testament and in New, and it emphasizes what God's emphasizing. Well, many years ago, God spoke to me in a dream. Verbally, in a dream. And he said, call the body of Christ, call my people to war. Now that's spiritual warfare. Then later he spoke to me and gave me the words, restoration, revival, and awakening. We must have a restored church. And only a restored church can bring about the, re the revival and the awakening that's needed. Now you got all the Pentecostals and the Baptists out talking about how evil is waxing worse and worse, and they're absolutely right. The devil is letting out all stops. Spirit of Antichrist is letting out all stops. But we're not going to be taken out of here until we finish our course. And part of finishing our course is to stand up in the name of Jesus and when Satan and his, his pastors who he's placed in the church, and if you know Scripture, you know it's in there, where it talks about Satan being an angel of light, says his ministers come disguised as ministers of righteousness. And there are those ministers not far from us. They're disguised as ministers of righteousness. And if you don't know Jesus in experience and know His Word thoroughly, they'll get you. They'll get you. Because they're going to say nice things. And they're going to butter you up. And a lot of times it's what they don't say. There are a lot of things that are hindering millions of Christians. Traditions of man. Jesus said, by your traditions, you make the Word of God of no effect. Now, they were speaking the Word of God, but they were making it of no effect because they were speaking it in the context of their traditions. False doctrines of man, such as a social gospel. You hear a lot about social justice today. It's a lie. It's a deception. The one they're using. Now, God's social justice is true. And we are to care 
for the poor. We are to bring healing to the brokenhearted. We are to set the captives free. But you see, it says in the Bible that uh, there be other Jesuses. There be other Gospels. Well, today, because people don't know Jesus intimately and His Word thoroughly, they're following another Gospel and another Jesus. Are you hearing me? Do you know the danger of this? The prosperity gospel. Universalism gospel. We have a friend uh, that lives out in the Carrollton area, and our friends, and we've reconnected with them recently. And uh, they were, one of them was sharing how somebody they knew from the past that we also knew from the past are now in a church that doesn't believe there's a hell. Of course, I've known about no hellers for years. But there's people all around us that are uh, supposed to be in Christian churches using the name of Jesus, but they're saying there are other ways to God. Saying there's no hell. There is a hell. There is a hell. Overemphasis on end time theories, and they are theories that distract from key truths such as Jesus and Him crucified, the Gospel of the Kingdom. Do you know what the Gospel of the Kingdom is? Let me tell you, it's the message that Jesus preached. Now He did say, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. But go start in, uh, early in Matthew and go through and you'll see that He preached the Gospel of the Kingdom. Now we've also got people saying that we're going to establish the kingdom on earth before Jesus returns. That's a deception too. But the truth is, right now, Jesus is supposed to be ruling in you. He's supposed to be ruling in me right now. And that's the kingdom. And when that kingdom power is released, and it is the kingdom power, then we'll see the captive set free. We'll see principalities and powers defeated. We'll stop for a moment and uh, anyone have a question? If you want to read the things that the Lord has given me, then just Get in touch with me and I'll give you my email address. You can have my phone number. We can talk. Uh, Brother Tony is a God called pastor. I served as a pastor for a long time, but my primary call is as a prophet. This uh, young man back in the back doesn't has not been ordained, but I promise you he is a God called minister. You should hear him minister. And uh, my heart grieves is something I, the uh, last thing I have written here, that the large majority of Christians in the United States have not been equipped properly. It's sad. But thank God for true pastors. Thank God for true evangelists. Thank God for true teachers. And sometimes pastors and teachers go together. Thank God for apostles and prophets. And this glorious church will not be manifest without all five of them. It's going to take all five of the ministry gifts to bring forth the glorious church. Now, in the United States, God established this country. This is a huge lie, this 1619 thing. Are you aware of that? How many of you heard of the 1619 thing? 
I believe I heard this week they've already got it in 3,500 school systems. Anyway, it's in a lot of school systems they're teaching it. It's a lie of the devil. You can ask about that later if you want to know what it is. It's a lie. It's a deception. There's so many things going on and God is looking for a people. Now, are we going to survive with our Christian freedom and American freedom? That's up to what we do. We got a reprieve four years ago. You would probably not have Christian freedom today if that election had gone the other way. Now I will make something clear to you. I have prayed from the moment I saw that President Donald Trump was going to be president and still pray that he doesn't turn on us. But if I had a chance to meet with him personally, I'd do it in love, but I'd do it in truth. In some place, I'd say, Brother President, love you in the Lord, praying for you. But you need to get that old nature on the cross. <clears throat> Did you hear it? But now, let's compare and contrast that. He's done a lot of great things and I pray that he continues four more years doing great things and doesn't turn on us. But if it goes the other way, you're going to find out what demonized means. And there's a huge difference in somebody in the flesh. I, I imagine every one of us in the last seven days has done something in the flesh. Anybody guilty of that? <laughs> so I promise you our president has done some things in the flesh but as of yet I, I've not seen that he's demonized have you brought Tony? have you brought Mark? but I'm telling you there's some demonized people out there running for certain offices and uh but it's bigger than them. That's why I mentioned the word globalism. But it's bigger than that. It's Satan. And I've tried to walk you through this before, but when God created mankind, He was creating a people for God and a bride for Christ. And when Jesus came, He didn't come just to make a way for our sins to be forgiven, He came to restore a people back to that place where we can be the bride of Christ. And guess what? That bride is going to rule and reign with Jesus forever. But we better get started right now. We better learn how to get in the gap and pray and Pray against principalities and powers because that's our real enemy. Now that doesn't mean that uh, there's fleshly people that are not bad. There's a lot of evil people. But what's motivating them are the principalities and powers. And so many people are talking about the Antichrist, the Antichrist. Study the Bible and you see Antichrist are already, when the Bible was written, not the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist is at work. And that spirit of Antichrist has been at work for thousands of years. And so... When it says contend earnestly for the faith, we are to boldly go out and share the things of Jesus in His kingdom, but we're to stand in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of the Lamb and defeat those principalities and powers. We overcome how? By the blood of the Lamb. By the word of our testimony and not loving our lives to the death. Are you familiar with that scripture? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. It's in Revelation. The word of our testimony and not loving our lives to the death. 
And there will be persecution. And for some in the United States, it's going to be unto death. Just like it is in other countries. So, I encourage you to pray and fast in the next uh, few days and speak truth. I promise you that most of us have a friend or relative that if they died today would go to hell. How serious are you about that? Are you praying and interceding? Are you crying out to God? There's one day this week my prayer walks in the morning. I, I was just crying out to God. And one of the neighbors uh, said to me, I believe it was Friday morning, she said, call us out. She said, when you see us doing a particular thing, she said, call us out. And I, and I, I immediately I said, well, I'm preaching Sunday and I'm going to do some calling out. So do you feel like you've been called out today? <laughs> I love you. I love the Lord. Fear not. But this thing is real. And uh, there's going to be a church in the image of Jesus whether we keep our Christian and American freedom or not. But it sure would be great to keep our Christian and American freedom. Brother Tommy, close us in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this word we've heard from you this morning. Father, we pray for help us to take it to heart now. Give us eyes to see what's going on in the world around us. Give us eyes to, to see your word, your truth, and what you would have us to do. Give us understanding. Father, give us the courage to be that people you call us to be, to be part of that glorious church that you call us to be. We need you, Father. And we just pray that your Spirit might fill us and empower us to be all that, that you want us to be, all that, that we need to be, all that this world needs us to be through our witness. Help us now as we go forth from here that we might be your church. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. I, I pray I'm able to be here next week, but when Brother Tony was ministering last week, uh, God's not given us a spirit of fear. But I kept giving, uh, and Derek Prince used to say, this is the Prince translation. <laughs> I kept reading it this way, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us a, the Holy Spirit of power, Holy Spirit of love, and the Holy Spirit of sound mind. Right? Amen.